Good evening, everyone. It's a beautiful evening out there. I hope you had some time to enjoy the zoo before coming in and for our presentation tonight. Yes, it was nice outside. So, welcome to the zoo. My name is Carol Strecker. I am the Vice President of Conservation, Education, and Nature here at the Minnesota Zoo. I'm so happy that you're here for our Our World Speaker Series tonight. We're very happy to have you join us. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment, which provides funding to make this event free for all of you to attend. To allow wider access for the presentation, we offer live captioning, with an emphasis on live. Our captioner is typing as I speak, having no idea what I'm going to say next, so we ask in advance for your understanding when words may be incorrect. It'd be kind of fun to watch, actually. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Eric Runquist. Uh, he is actually our butterfly biologist here at the Minnesota Zoo. He has been chasing butterflies since he was a kid, growing up in Oregon. He attended the University of Florida and studied under Dr. Thomas Emmel, uh, one of the world's leading butterfly biologists. Uh, he got a Bachelor of Science in Ecology, which um, really led to what his superpower is, which is rearing and breeding butterflies, uh, which he did in the Florida Keys when he got his undergrad degree. He moved on to get his PhD in Ecology at the University of California, Davis, also chasing butterflies, this time in the high Sierra Nevada. He joined the Minnesota Zoo in 2012, to launch our Prairie Butterfly Conservation Program. And uh, he's going to pick it up from there, telling you all about what he's been doing since 2012 here at the Minnesota Zoo. The other thing I wanted to mention, however, I said he had a superpower of rearing and breeding endangered butterflies, and he's um, extending that superpower as part of the Minnesota State of Minnesota's Interagency Pollinator Protection Team which is the best name ever for a statewide initiative uh, designed to protect pollinators. Uh, and they meet regularly. It's representatives from different state agencies working to create consistency across the state in how Minnesota can be a leader in protecting pollinators. And Eric is the Minnesota Zoo's representative to the Interagency Pollinator Protection Team. So with that, I will introduce and turn the mic over to Dr. Eric Runquist. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Yes, I never, you never knew I was a superhero. I didn't know that until now, too. I mean, that's my secret, right? Okay, so um, welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight. I am, again, Eric, and I really love coming here and giving these talks and talking about pollinators and, and Butterflies, and it's a fabulous time of year to really get excited about those things as, as spring is emerging. So I'm here to talk to you really about how to, the things we can be doing is saving Minnesota's pollinators um, and the, the problems they are facing and um, how, yeah, how we can get involved and how you can be a superhero too. So most of you might think of pollinators and think of this. What is this? It's a bee. What kind of bee? Honeybee. Honeybee, yes. And where is it from? Europe. Europe, yep, yep. Europe. This is the European honeybee. That's the common name of this species. Uh, it is the most um, utilized insect in the world. We use it for um, a vast majority of our, our pollination of, of our crops. Um, and and uh, for beekeepers, anybody, are there any beekeepers in the room tonight? One, two, good. Okay, good. I'm not going to talk about honeybees tonight. All right? Um, so, really what I want to talk about are, are the actual native bees that we re really rely on and are the other pollinators. Okay, what is this? Monarch. Monarch. Good job. Yeah. Um, excellent. Good job on the quiz. Um, so, the monarch is also kind of your, your sentinel butterfly that most people have heard about. They, we know that monarchs are in trouble. Their numbers are down about 80% over the last two decades, and it's a real concern. Um, they have this phenomenal migration between Minnesota and Mexico and back with multiple generations. And I'm curious, has anybody seen a monarch this year? Two? Oh, yeah, where? I just saw one yesterday fly right by my front 
yeah, cool. So they're they're, they're back. You saw them in this. It would start where? Key West. Key West. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I just didn't count. <laughs> I, I heard they're in Iowa now, though. Yeah. So, so they're they needed that one little bit of weather to, to your, those couple warm days to get up here, and it sounds like we the first ones have started making it in Minnesota just now. So that's awesome. Those are really the the grandchildren of the individuals that were here last September. That have migrated, they migrated down to Mexico, spent the winter in Mexico, and bred as bred in the spring as, as as they were getting leave, ready to leave Mexico. They migrated back up to about Texas, and where they were laying their eggs, and then they had a nice big long life. Nine months as an insect is forever. It's like a 140 year old person, um, and so then their children made it up to about um, St. Louis, maybe Southern Iowa for their that next migration and then we are seeing the next wave coming up right now and we will have another one to two to three generations that we will be able to produce here this summer before the ones in September fly all the way back to Mexico then begin the cycle again that super generation I'm not going to talk about monarchs much today either <laughs> I really want to talk about some of these other little things you may not know much about so for example Minnesota is home to about 425 species of bees, Four, like native bees that most people will actually have never taken much time to notice. But these are really the workhorses of our, of our ecosystems, um, especially in the plant insect interaction world. So this is one of the leafcutter bees, on a, one of our cone flowers. Now what do pollinators do? Well, uh, the major thing that they do is they pollinate. <laughs> um, so this is a pollinator. It looks like mostly a flower, but that is the backside of a bumblebee that has climbed its way inside of a penstemon, um, also called the beard, smooth beard tongue, one of our native um, flowers, and it's reaching inside there to grab nectar and also pollen from that plant. And it's ups actually upside down. It's actually quite amazing to watch these things land on a plant, flip upside down and curl up and to reach that nectar inside. So the plants are providing nectar for the, for the, uh, in, for the bee as a food source and as well as the pollen, that's also a food source for their offspring. Um, and then as the bee is moving between different flowers, it is moving that pollen from one plant to the next for seed, for seed production. So that's really kind of what pollinators do. They help plants move pollen from one plant to the next to create the next generation of plants. Most plants have a pollination system going on, uh, most flowering plants that is, that are tied to an insect system of some sort or other kinds of animals. What is this? Did I hear, did I hear fly? Yes, good job, that's a fly. So, not a bee. Makes you want to think it's a bee, but it's not a bee. Many other kinds of insects pretend to be a bee because, you know, bees can sometimes have a little bit of an intimidating factor with that sting thing that they can sometimes do. I'll just add in general, almost all of our bees cannot sting you, or if they do, it's going to be such a minor thing, you're not really even going to notice it. And just like with snakes or anything like that, they're not going to really, they're not out there to get you unless you really, really make them mad and they feel threatened for their own life. Okay, so just set it and forget it, don't worry, be happy kind of a thing. Um, the, the, the bees are not really out there to get you in the first place at all. So, but then there are a number of other insects that, that try to mimic that system and trick you into thinking it's bees, so you leave it alone too. This is one of our hoverflies, the serpents. They are very important pollinators as well. So what is this? Hummingbird. Good, good. I was, I was hoping you would nail that one. Uh, not a bee. Uh, so they are also pollinators, but they're really not out there looking for the pollen as much. They are looking for the nectar rewards from those plants. So not all, in, not all pollinators are actually actively seeking the nectar reward, or they're seeking the pollen. Um, but they can also accidentally transfer pollen between flowers. Oh. That's not a pollinator. <laughs> it's a frog, one of, our, one of our native tree frogs. But the act of building ecosystems around flowering plants brings a lot of other healthy things along with it. 
These, I've seen more than one frog sitting on top of, of and sitting inside flowers before. Maybe that's actually a system where, like, oh, the little bug's going to fly along, land on the flower, so the, the froggy can eat it. Or it could just be a nice sunny spot to sit in. But I really want to talk about and focus on, for a lot of my talk today, are about some butterflies you may not have heard about, but are also in a lot of trouble and can tell us more about our systems and what might be going on with them. So, for example, this is the Dakota skipper. It is a Minnesota native butterfly. It is an endangered species at the state level and threatened at the national level. And uh, this has now become part of the photo arc, a project by the National Geographic photographer Joel Sartori, who has gone around to zoos around the world photographing endangered species, documenting them as, a, as, a, as, a, or as an organism and as an individual, and personalizing that relationship with them. And he, he is, um, done some quite phenomenal work. Um, I think he's in seven, 8,000 species now. Um, and has come to the Minnesota Zoo and photographed some of our Dakota skippers. And um, I will also add that one of my colleagues, Emily Royer, who is one of my employees, uh, she has gone through and listed and evaluated how Dakota skipper ranks among the world's endangered species as well using this program from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And they have a red list that's basically equivalent to our endangered species list, and it qualifies as endangered on the global scale as well. And that will be published apparently July 4th. So the Dakota skipper had this range historically that was roughly from Chicago up into southeastern Saskatchewan. Um, and the kind of the white areas are kind of an inferred historic range. Those little dots are where we used, where we, we, the butterfly used to be found, where we have physically observed the butterfly before, but um, we may not necessarily know if it's still there anymore, but we can kind of infer that it was across that whole range. Now, um, and that's really because people could get on the ground and actually look for the butterfly in the first place. You'll notice that a lot of those dots are red, and if anybody's red, green, color blind in here, I'm sorry, but that was, I didn't think of that when the slide was made. Um, but, so we, we have a lot of spots where now the butterfly has largely disappeared. And in Minnesota, we may only have one population left of the historic extent. So, this is about, gone from about three-fourths of all the places we knew it used to be at. Within that whole range, most of that habitat is also gone, so this is like three-fourths of one percent or three-fourths of, of the 99% disappearance. So, a uh, pretty bad situation. We think it's extinct also in the southern part of its range. Now the Powashik skipperling. This is an endangered species at both the national and the state level and has been evaluated as critically endangered at the global level. So this is right up there with some of the most endangered species on Earth, like the Malayan tapir, um, condor, like many other things, that, like the really iconic animals of, of what you think of as an endangered species. But it's also the most Minnesotan butterfly in the world. Uh, it had half of its historic range was in the state of Minnesota. Unfortunately, we think it's extinct in Minnesota now. This is the most Minnesotan butterfly in the world. Um, also gone from really basically all of its range except for tiny, tiny little spots in Michigan and Manitoba and maybe Wisconsin. So we're talking about what used to be one of the most predictably common butterflies in, in, in Minnesota and on our prairies is now right up there with, there are only hundreds left. You know, we probably had millions of this butterfly historically across the prairies. Now it's right on the edge of extinction. And that's a recent event too. Question in the back. Why? Good question. I'm going to get to why in a second. But I just see that they just, it just um, seems that it's so desperate. Yeah, so the, the question of why is a really good one and a complicated one. Um, and oh, can I get to that in just one second? Yeah. Um, so this now lands in, in comparison with like bite where bison were about 150 years ago. Um, or even more recently than that, when there were just hundreds of bison remaining in the world. 
we were able to bring bison back. The question is, um, can we bring Powashi Skipperling back and Dakota Skipperling back too? Um, so there are large pieces of prairie. This gets to that question of why they disappeared in the first place. There are still some beautiful prairies out there. In, in Minnesota, for example, this is one of our, our preserves in the southwest quarter of Minnesota in Pipestone County. Thousands of acres of, of pristine habitat. They were here until about 15 years ago. Disappeared around 2008 or so. Was the last time Powashik Skipling was observed in Minnesota, even though it had been really common in the mid to or the early 2000s. But within about a decade, it just collapsed in those last little bits where it used to be. The same is true for Dakota Skipper. Um, and these are ecosystems that are home to really iconic wildlife too. It's not just these butterflies. Um, you know, this is where the bison roamed, and we got these beautiful birds like bobolinks and, and, and grouse and um, a lot of other really important and beautiful pollinators as well. Um, and there are, and these, are, these two species that I'm going to be talking about are not just the only ones that are in trouble. They are actually one of 15 butterflies that are listed at, at the state of Minnesota, uh, by the state of Minnesota as endangered, threatened, or a special concern. And 10 of those 15 depend on prairie. So two-thirds of the butterflies in the most trouble in Minnesota are actually our prairie butterflies, depending on one ecosystem which is now largely extinct. And eight of those 15 we think are already gone from Minnesota. So we really lost half of these, probably. So that's pretty dire. Why did they disappear in the first place? Getting to your question. Well, it's going to be a complex answer, unfortunately. And we, unfortunately, are not going to know all of the answers. But certainly the big driver is the loss of the prairie itself. We only have about... Well, prairie used to, to, lap, to cover about a third of Minnesota, um, the, su the southern and western third of the state. And that's uh, this area in blue here on this historic map. Um, we only have about a one and a half percent of that prairie remaining. So now we have to think about each of these little <coughs> fragments of prairie. We have to think about this more of an island system, not of a, this, ex this former ocean of grasslands that stretched on for a thousand miles north and south. And when you're a little butterfly that doesn't like to move, or you're a big bison that needs massive amounts of prairie, that's a problem, right? When the next piece of prairie is 15 miles down the road, you're not going to get to it. So then it becomes a local issue as well. And unfortunately, we don't always know the exact causes of why those butterflies disappeared in the first place every single time. Um, it could be lots of things. It could be uh, the invasion of some European grasses that are kind of choking out a lot of the native prairie um, and reducing the quality of our prairie for those butterflies. It could be insecticide drift from adjacent agricultural operations. This is now the breadbasket of America in a lot of cases. Um, and we have been documenting insecticides in prairies. The real question, though, is are those insecticide levels dangerous? That's kind of the next step. We're finding a correlation. We don't know if there's much causation yet. That's some science that needs to be done. We've started it, but it's not complete yet. Um, there could be just random events. So that was a really terrible year. It was a really hot, dry year. And so there's very little breeding this year. And so the next, the next generation is going to be down. And when you get more and more isolated from that, you get these small population isolation effects where there's just not the ability to rescue from one population to the next. So unfortunately, it's, it's a complicated question and we're not going to know every situation. We are trying to get at some of those, though. The Prairie Butterfly Conservation Program was, was again, launched in 2012 and really was in the beginning of a kind of an experimental program where we wanted to know, is there a role for zoo-based breeding of, of these rare butterflies to help out with the conservation of the species? There is interest in, and we, we probably are not going to be able to get the species back to a healthy state without sort of recolonizing a lot of that historic range and getting it back. But the only way to really, really do that is probably to do these mass rearing and reintroduction efforts. So, but 
Never had that been done with these butterflies before. So we were kind of beginning from the from the very bottom. The question. You just touched briefly on weather. Yeah. Um, climate change. So yeah, the question is about climate change is one of those factors, and that certainly could be one of the important ones that we are interested in. And we actually have an experiment running right now where we are growing caterpillars under different temperatures. We think that if it gets too hot, then they will grow too fast. And if you have one generation of year and you were only supposed to be an adult in late July or late June and early July, if you were off by two weeks, you're effectively removed from the population. And so you, you, there's a very important piece where you need to be in sync with everybody else. And if conditions get a little bit wonky, or you, you get out of sync with the, the flower resources that you need, um, then that's a real problem. We're also concerned about um, decreasing snowpack in the winter and more variable snowpacks. Um, so maybe more periods where they, we get snow, but then we lose it, and then we get it and we lose it. These butterflies hibernate as a caterpillar on our prairies. And um, they, we think they need a really consistent, predictable snowpack as a protection layer, both against the big extreme weather events, but also against little predators that are looking for something in the middle of winter that's full of protein and yummy to eat, right? So there could be a protection factor there that we're worried about. So climate change is definitely a factor we're concerned about. There's research going on here at, and at of one of our partner zoos, the Assiniboine Park Zoo in Winnipeg. And, um, and some of the labs are, are, are very much interested in this. So very good question. Um, so, at the zoo we have been rearing now multiple generations of, of butterflies. This is the life cycle of the Dakota skipper from the egg, the caterpillar, the pupa stage, the chrysal, the, the adult, and breeding. We've actually now for the first time, um, we're the first and only institution in the world to now be able to breed Dakota skippers and multiple generations of Dakota skippers in a row. So, we're really excited about that. The partnership has been growing and it seems like every year I'm adding up a new logo for a partner, which is a great thing to be, it's a great problem to be having, to be figuring out how to crown those on these beautiful pictures. Um, and so it's really also now become an international effort as well, with, with Canadian partners trying to save the only Canadian populations of power sheets here point. Here's one of our successes. Now I work at a zoo and so I'm supposed to like show adorable baby animal photos every time. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> this is a Dakota skipper hatching from its egg and eating its egg. They're the first meal of insects of, of most butterflies is the actual egg itself that it grew from. Go to town, man. <laughs> Sped up. And you can see the other, there's another egg there just about to hatch up on top. That is the first and only time that has ever been filmed. So, congratulations <laughs> for being one of the few to ever see, see that. Uh, we now are at the level where we are actually starting to bust our seams out a little bit with, with the number of, of skippers in our care. Uh, it, we have two hoop houses, open air hoop houses, where we rear and grow our skippers. These are all behind the scenes, so you can't actually see them when you come to the zoo. But, when you're out at the bison exhibit and you look across and you kind of imagine there's a big building back there, imagine a couple more buildings behind that and that's where we are. <laughs> um, but in the summer, we really get super busy and each one of these potted plants here with a, with a metal shelter around it and then basically a bridal veil around the top of that as a, as a security feature, each one of these pots can have three to ten caterpillars on it. And there, oh, it's your baby, right there, it's your baby to go to Skipper. And we're just now in the process of beginning our, our, the removal of our caterpillars from hibernation and bringing them out to begin the new generation this year. Going into winter, we had about 700 Dakota Skipper caterpillars, um, and that's record. We keep going up a couple hundred more each year. Um, we'll have to get a new hoop house here pretty soon if we keep on our current trajectory, and that's a good problem to have. Where do they go? So then where do they go? Yeah, that's the next question. The real question is, yeah, pause that thought. And insert David Attenborough right here. And this is, this is where I wish I had some audio of emerging of 
A. Do you see it? The Dakota skipper is emerging from its chrysalis. This also was the first time this had ever been filmed. It's coming. Look at that. So that's a male. It's a boy. <laughs> this blade of grass that was inconveniently just exactly the wrong spot, there's a female that had come out just a, a few hours beforehand. So he will crawl, this is the shelter that he had built as a caterpillar and turned into as a chrysalis. They live inside this, this thing, it's basically stitched together grasses, um, and he will then climb up and sit on that grass and inflate his wings, let the wings dry out, and be ready to fly away. So is this Mark? So this was, uh, this was actually one of our plots here in, um, at the zoo, um, and this was in July or early June, a couple years ago. So where did they go? The real, real goal of our situation is not to just have a population of Dakota skippers at, at the zoo. That's, that's not the goal, that's not the point, right? We really want to be contributing to the conservation of the wild, and so for them, um, and for Powashik Skipperling, it's about restoring lost populations, or populations that are in trouble. So we went through a very intensive review process, following some very internationally recognized structured decision-making processes, and came up with two plans that are different for each species. So for Powashik Skipperling, again, the one that's super endangered, right on the edge of global extinction, the idea is to let's not lose any more populations. Let's try to support those populations that are in the most trouble and stabilize those and learn from that in the process. And then hopefully, at the same time, learn something that we can be using to, to uh, get lost populations back. But the first step is let's, let's just stop the bleeding. Let's get them out of the ER. Okay. So what we ended up doing is one of our staff members will go out to this last little population in Michigan. This is really the, the heart of the only part of the U.S. range left that's in Michigan in the world, um, between Flint and Detroit, in suburbia, but in these rare prairie fen habitats that are, um, that are not really suitable for um, development. That's where they're hanging on, apparently. And that is not really the range that they were in originally, but it's what's left. So one of our staff will go out and collect wild females and then collect some eggs from her. Basically, that means taking her to a hotel room inside of a little cup where she lays eggs in a protected manner, safe space. Um, return those females then back to the wild where we got her in the first place so she can continue laying eggs. Those eggs that are then brought back to the zoo and reared through for the next year uh, into the chrysalis or the pupa stage. And then we bring them back out to the spot where we got them in the first place to, um, for, as they, to be released then as an adult. And the idea is by this process we can get rid of, hopefully, reduce the mortality that's in the highest stages. So we think the, especially the very young caterpillars have the most troubles. And uh, that's where we expect most of the mortality to occur in the wild. If we can trim even a little bit off of that, that's a gain. And we're, we're putting more adults into the wild. We think the big problem with them is that there's just not enough adults out there interacting with each other at this point to be able to sustain a mating population. And we, re we will be repeating that population or this process over multiple years. Is the water issue in Flint a problem for them? The water issue, thankfully, the water issue in Flint is not a problem for them. Um, they are in areas that are not fed by the Flint River <laughs> or using those pipes. Um, so we repeat that over multiple years, and this last year was our first year of success. Um, this is my hard working co-worker, uh, co uh, Kale Nordmeyer, and he is one of our, um, he's the butterfly conservation specialist here at the, at the zoo. And uh, this is the, the box where we would bring out those butterflies um, as the chrysalis. And here is one of those adults that emerging. Here's the chrysalis that it just, that just emerged from, and the one next to it down there, um, and then released them back out of the wild. So that's at least 
a demonstration of the process. We started off with five eggs and we got two adults out of it. That's not, doesn't seem like much, but it was kind of a proof of concept in the very first year of attempting it. We think the survivorship of, of really most butterflies from egg to adulthood is about two to three percent in the wild, maybe. If we can get that to forty percent, hey, that's that's a whole lot more number of individuals that could be out there for, for breeding in the first place. Of course, if we can do better than that, that'd be great. And I'll I will happily report that we we just brought out sixteen larvae this year from Powashi Superling that are destined to go back out to Michigan this year, um, and that was starting with I think. 40 eggs, so we're, we're getting better every year. It's great. And I will also add that I think I mentioned earlier, we are, we are partnering with the Assiniboine Park Zoo in Winnipeg. They are working on the only Canadian populations of power sheep superling. They released five from their into their back into their population this year, and I think this is probably the best photo of power sheep superling ever taken. Really beautiful. Now for Dakota Skipper, it's a little bit different of a, of a process, and there it's reintroduction. We have more healthy populations of Dakota Skipper than we do for Powashik. And so there it's about, let's, what does it take to get dots back onto the map in the first place? How do we um, you know, start re 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 repopulating the world? Um, so the same similar process we use for their collecting eggs out of the wild, returning those females back to the spot where we got them. Maintaining a pop breeding population here at the zoo. Doing that, we've done now, now, done that for multiple years now. Um, now the next thing is the reintroduction process to try to get back lost populations. And so we've selected this site in southwest Minnesota. We've done now two years of reintroduction at this spot of, of zoo reared Dakota skippers, and we're preparing for a third year. So. The 700 or so Dakota skippers that we've got at the zoo right now, we're hoping at least 400 of those can be released this year. Back out to this preserve. Then, if we can get really successful in that and learn from that in the process, the idea is then to connect the dots. So let's get dots back on the map and then figure out what's needed to connect them again. So this is our release site here in southwest Minnesota at the Hole in the Mountain Prairie Preserve. With that release box again. This is the, essentially the process. Insert David Attenborough again. There you go. So now for the last two years, we've been reintroducing them here. Um, this is roughly what the large preserve looks like. It's about 1,500 acres. And the first year, we released 200 from this spot near where that car is parked from right there. That's our little release box. And the, the year after that, we released 250 more from there. And all of this used to be colonized um, by Dakota skippers. So you re a really good, healthy population. Um, and we, we think it's, we've got great buy-in and great management techniques, and we think we're, we're in a good place for this butterfly. This ridge is a really fantastic habitat. We're, we're excited to see them starting to recolonize this habitat. So that means we have to not only release the butterflies, but we have also got to figure out how well we're doing. <laughs> A question. Are you using some of the sponsorship on buying some of the land back and actually making it more, more preserved? Uh, the question is, are we using uh, sponsorships to reconnect or uh, to purchase adjacent land so we can do more of that connecting with that? We don't have the power to really do that, um, but I think it, it is the goal. Um, one of our goals is to, is to figure out what is the what are the conditions needed for successful establishment of populations and doing that in a science-driven science way so that we can then provide prescriptions of, of what, are, what are the habitat types that we need for them. Um, and that could be then a, a public-private partnership as well. So we getting towards that is a really good question and a, an important long-term goal. Another question. Working along the same lines, are you working with communities and like the wildlife refuge as they are turning parts of their property into back to uh, prairie land, are you working with them so that you can do that kind of partnership? Yeah. So the question is, are we working with those sorts of organizations, uh, like refuges and, and other um, big institutions? And, and yes, we we actually are. Um, 
trying to connect with as many people as we can and, and talk about, the, again, the kinds of conditions that are needed. Um, this has never been done before, this reintroduction. And so we're, we're literally going to be writing the book on what is needed to do it. Um, and we've had a lot of interested land managers coming to us of, of, for ideas and, and guidance. And so it's a, it's a growing network. So I would say yes, yeah, we have been working with those agencies. Do you have colleges and universities with interns that you're working with in different places? Do we have university interns and, and uh, things like that that we're working with? Uh, we've had some. Uh, they're, uh, they're are coming to us. We're still at a, at, a, at a level where we don't have a lot of capacity, but the, really the major limiting thing right now is, is is eyes on the ground and being able to confidently identify these butterflies in the first place. Um, and there are very few people in the world that could do that. Um, and so research at the university level is going to be one of those really important plug-ins, especially as we get into more, more and more ecology. And good question. One more. Yeah. So yes, we, we actually physically go out and we try to count them. Um, in addition to uh, just letting the uh, letting them go every every day from this box over over roughly a four week period, we have one of our staff member on the ground at this preserve, repeatedly walking that prairie over and over and over again every day, um, looking at where they are in, in the landscape. And from that, we've been able to re-observe a lot of individuals, and I'll show a couple of maps on that in the first place. Um, but here's actually the very first one we ever found back out in the wild. Um, super happy to see that. So that's one of those first things you want to check off. This is about this. We think this is the first one observed there in a decade. Excellent. So that's good. So I have a question. So you and I talked about how excited oh, you're the presenter, how I take my monarchs mm -hmm. before I release them. Um, so do you think that? Are or whatnot that you aren't able to take them yet and track that. Yeah, the question is can we use sort of the, the, the monarch tracking <coughs> regime or, or something like that for these kinds of butterflies and employ it in the citizen science? Unfortunately, it's not probably one of those situations where it's going to be really feasible, partly because they're basically gone from everywhere. Um, and two, Skippers are little powerful creatures with very small wings, <laughs> um, and it takes a lot to be able to handle them. Um, and I'll also add, because they are a federally protected species, there's also very tight restrictions on, on the, the kinds of activities you can be doing with them, and, and very few people are permitted to even touch them or hold them in the first place. Hopefully we can get to that spot, but right now we don't have really have the ability to, to employ it on a larger scale. But we do, I do frequently get emails from people from like, hey, I'm in Bloomington and I got a skipper in my backyard and it's a Dakota skipper and come over and get it. And I'm like, well, I love the enthusiasm on that, but it's, I can pretty much guarantee it's not going to be one of those. There are many other kinds of species out there. And uh, we'll get to actually a little bit of that in a minute. We need to be able to be more encompassing and have broader attention on those species in the first place, get the, the attention in the first place. Um, so this is a map of where we've seen butterflies in that preserve in the, f in the first year, and mostly we're clustered within about a 40 meter area right around where we did that release box, but some of them straight way up on that hill, about 300 meters away. That's good. That, that was um, one of those things we wanted to see was them moving around through the landscape. The next year, oh, look at that, they moved even more, a whole lot more individuals found through them through a much larger area. So we think they're colonizing that really good habitat. This is one of those, another one of those big boxes we need to check off for success. Then, what's that? Can you tell? That's breeding of Dakota skippers. So um, this is the, probably the first time in a decade that, we've, that we know Dakota skippers could breed, were breeding in the wild in the first place and in the southwest corner of Minnesota. And now we've seen multiple mating events in the wild and we can confirm that they are also laying eggs. Here's a female laying an egg, right there. Right there is the egg on that little piece of grass that she laid it on. Actually, not a living piece of grass, but it's close enough to something that's living. And so I actually collected that egg, 
brought it back to the zoo, and oh, another baby! So, <laughs> that's one of the big wins we needed, was to be able to confirm successful breeding in the wild. We established no new, new generations each year. So, we're hopeful that we're, we're making an impact and we're learning in the process. But it really also needs to be a data-driven thing. And some of that means we learning we are learning what they are doing in the wild and the resources they are utilizing. A lot of that is which flowers are they visiting in the first place. Sometimes that also leads to sad moments, your womp womp of those butterflies that you've just been reintroducing into the wild being eaten in the wild too. Uh, so we've now seen several times where crab spiders, which are flower or which are, they would sit inside flowers or waiting for those pollinators um, and have been eating some of our skippers that we just released. Now that might seem like the disaster and really a sad moment and you know I don't like to see it but, it but it actually gives me a lot of hope and excitement too because this is them as a natural member of their ecosystem again for the first time. This is a piece of that web of, of the prairie that is in really serious danger starting to get reestablished a little bit. So what we really want to be able to do is learn from this and what is it going to take to reestablish those populations in the first place. And uh, we, we're doing a lot of science involved in this more than I really have the time to get into to now. But, but one of those big ones is, is kind of that habitat prescription piece that I talked about. Of what, are, what are the kinds of things that we need to have with prairies in order to have our, our skippers back? And in the process of making better prairie for the butterflies, we also are going to be making better prairie for a lot of other things at the same time. Roughly 96% of songbirds depend on insect larvae for food. And when we lose those, we're going to lose a lot of our songbirds. And it's probably not a, not a surprise that this, the declines in our, our songbirds are also correlated with global declines in insects. Now, butterflies also have a lot of, and pollinators have a lot of science and popularity behind them in terms of uh, studies. And as has been raised, monarchs are one of those kind of sentinel species for um, understanding their migration with, with tagging, where you can put a little sticker tag on the side of the wing and look for it then in Mexico. Or wherever you are, you, if you find one, you can report it back and you make it that way we can learn about how they're moving through the landscape. So that has been a really important means of engaging people in the first place. And I think this gets towards the feature where butterflies and pollinators are, are really romantic and charismatic creatures in the first place. And um, there's just something uniquely enchanting about them that gets a lot of attention. They're beautiful creatures if you, if you get up close to them and really under, try to understand them. There also are gains in terms of, of just that that really that, that can make that personal connection with people and with children. Uh, this is one of our, re uh, we had a family come out and see our reintroduction effort here and, and those kids were so excited to see that. Um, probably for a butterfly they had never seen before and their parents had never heard of before, right? But it was a, it was a kind of a, you could see kind of the lights turning on, which is really neat to see. This is the Minnesota Zoo's booth at the Minneapolis Monarch Festival. A super popular event in Minneapolis in fall. I recommend you go if you, if you, if you can. We also get media attention from our work. This is your butterfly paparazzi trying to find those red butterflies. <laughs> and we also had a, a film crew from the uh, TV show Prairie Sportsman come out, which is a branch of Pioneer TV. Uh, basically public TV in western Minnesota. They filmed this really great documentary about our efforts and it's, it's online on Prairie Public and will be broadcast statewide or, or on the other networks, um, uh, public TV networks uh, like on TPT here later this summer. So look for it. <laughs> That's not a pollinator. <laughs> but that pumpkin I was pollinated by a pollinator. In fact, there are very specialized groups of bees, called squash bees, that are the primary pollinators of pumpkins and squash and zucchini. And we really would not be able to have things like the jack o lantern Spectacular we had here at the zoo this fall, and we'll be having again this, this, this fall, 
Um, without little bees you've probably never heard, heard of or noticed before. So Mona Lisa, thank you. There are really some amazing jewels that are in our backyard that go unnoticed and they're doing those important functions. And so we, it's up to us to provide that responsibility and to be able to help them out in the first place. So I want to ask you, will you help me? Help, help them in the first place. So first thing you can do, I've got five actions for you. One is plant for pollinators. And I hope on the way in or on the way out you grab seed packet of a guide of or the seed packet and then a guide of some great Minnesota native wildflowers that are great for pollinators and this is a you know, a subset even of, of a broader guide that we have online. So plant for pollinators <clears throat> and get to know those butterflies in the first place that are flying around your your garden. So I know several of these are around right now to be seen. So definitely not a comprehensive guide, but a, hopefully a starter guide. So again, think about that engagement. So we, we really emphasize the use of, of native species because that's really what the, the native pollinators are mostly cued on. Um, they, they are going to be providing the, the richest rewards. A lot, unfortunately, of the, the flowers we buy typically provide no reward for pollinators because we are breeding them for our own purposes and usually that means the plant then doesn't need to provide the nectar or really doesn't need to provide pollen anymore. We are doing the, that job that the insect pollinators would be doing in the first place. So essentially if, if you find like a zinnia that's got like 85 petals on it, of these big gray, these big gray flower discs, uh, these really big ones, that's really not going to be providing much of a reward anymore. But some of those ones that just have a single row are fine. Or just like this, uh, the sedum at the end of the year, or sunflower. There are still some good alternatives that are not natives, but uh, the the native species are really best suited to our conditions and our pollinators. So go for that, um, and also do it in a pesticides free way. Always an important statement today. Uh, for example, on that uh, non-native side, here's a, one of the a, one of the mining bees that was flying around our garden. This weekend, and what's on this leg? Pollen. Oh, pollen, yeah. Can you guess, what is a yellow flower blooming right now? Dandelions. Dandelions, right. So that's one of those, unfortunately, there are, not, there are very few spring flowers out there that, that in most habitats anymore, especially in the cities, where pollinators that are waking up from hibernation can get the valuable resources that they need. Dandelion is one of those important bridges until more species coming on later in the year. So I say, let your dandelions bloom once you go to seed, you know, or just before they get ready to seed, then that's fine, take them out. But I would wait, because right now they're really providing a unique and important food source. So the main thing here for planting for pollinators, floral diversity is key, and that means spanning the entire year, so spring through fall. Lots of different species. Um, and that's going to be helping every, every step of the way. For example, here in the spring, we've got service berry. These are just blooming right now. And uh, one of those nice little small trees that can be a really nice accent point. We've got one out in our front yard. It's blooming right now, and I love it. Um, other species a little bit later in the year, black-eyed Susan, always a good one, fast and easy to grow. Um, lots of nice nectar and pollen rewards, too. And if you're wondering, that's an Acadian hair streak. Minnesota native. Bee balm, really a fabulous plant, um, tremendously rich nectar source. This is one of our hummingbird hawk moths. Um, and bee balm is also uh, one of these plants that's called superfood um, for bees, uh, for especially bumblebees. It's got really, uh, it, it appears to have sort of immune boosting features going on in the plant that help in bees. Blazing stars at the end of the year, we think of milkweed is really critical for monarchs. Uh, blazing star and those flowers that are blooming at the very end of the year are even more important in, in some ways because they are the, the, they are the power source for, for these butterflies to get to Mexico. They are blooming exactly at the same time that the monarchs are getting ready to go and they're a really important food source. Another one of those late season one is the England aster and, and some of the other asters too. 
Milkweed's, of course, super important for monarchs as a, as a host plant uh, for, the, for the caterpillars, also a tremendously rich nectar source. Uh, they actually have a very complicated pollination system where it really requires a big insect to be able to pollinate them because it, it, inside of each of these little pits in the flower um, are the, these sacks of pollen that have to be pulled out by a large insect. And little insects, unfortunately, get stuck on them sometimes. But, you know, they're, they're, they're really specialized and important plants. And as I said, they're really, that's, milkweeds are the really important plants for, for the, the nectar, or caterpillar sources for monarchs. Um, things like the milkweed tussock moth are also depending on milkweeds. These are like your little Shih Tzu puppies of, of the caterpillar world. <laughs> Twitch together as a, as a group and you touch the plant. It's pretty adorable. Uh, willows provide an important early season pollen and nectar source, um, but are also then host plants for a wide variety of other species, um, like the morning cloak, the white admiral, the, the viceroy. Grasses, don't forget about the grasses. They are not actually producing any nectar or pollen sources for the, for the animals because they are wind pollinated, but they are also food for the caterpillars. So like little blue stem is a, this beautiful bluish green in the summer, turns red in winter, it's really a, kind of a nice accent piece. But they are the prime, they are the host plants for the skippers that we're working with and other grass feeding skippers. Um, this is the, the shelter that the, the skipper built here, that sort of web. Um, and inside there is where the caterpillar lives, right there. And they form their chrysalis right inside there. And you saw that one emerging from the Chrysalis in the video. Um, you also need to provide structural diversity for your for your lawn or for where these these pollinators are. Where's the butterfly? The tree. The tree. On the tree. Good. Where in the tree? No, right that's the tree. It's right there. <laughs> right there. So there's the morning cloak. These are hibernate as an adult in the summer, and, or in the, through the winter, um, and then they're, they're, what they do is basically they pretend to be a piece of bark, and they will and burrow themselves down into a little corner of a tree and spend the winter there. And they, they would, usually the first butterfly is up and flying around on the first 50 degree days in April or March or June, whatever, you know, <laughs> some years. So. Um, this is the butterfly equivalent of the adult night out. Um, provide the bar of nectar or well, of, of water and, and soil. Um, muddy patches are going to be really important by providing salt resources that are usually limiting in butterfly diets and pollinator diets. These are also, these little patches of open dirt are really important nesting sources for a lot of our native bees. So leave little bits like that. Number two, take the moon pollinator garden challenge. There are registry systems out there where if you get your system established and you, you get your little pollinator garden going, you can be part of the larger community and show that you are contributing. There are other, other systems as well besides the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge, but it's a fun one. And those can be of any scale, of any size, but they can help make those important connections as well. And this release really leads to the story of responsible stewardship of our lands. Uh, for example, the Minnesota Zoo, on our east parking lots, the ones you probably didn't come into today, but on the other side of the zoo where we come in, maybe come in on a busy summer day, um, used to be just your standard lawn grass around the edge of the parking lot. But then in 2012, we replaced it with a bunch of prairie, prairie flower, wildflowers. And it's super busy now with pollinators and really a, a nice, beautiful resource for a lot of species and kids will jump in there and, the kids, and parents can take a beautiful picture of the kids and the flowers. Neat stuff. Now, um, these are also tying in, the, when, you, when you do these sorts of things, you can be helping out not just pollinators, you can be helping out other things like our water quality. Native plants usually have really deep roots, they anchor our soils and they, those provide really important filtering systems for our water resources. And I saw some of you look over there, I, I think one of the owls behind the wall just said hi. <laughs> um, anyway, so the zoo has installed several of these rain gardens with demonstration points. Um, and so there, there are multiple levels of benefits. I will add at this point what's inside that little square. Can you guess? Okay, can you first guess what that plant is? 
Bergamot, yep, the bee balm. Now, what's inside that little square? It's a bee. Anything else? There. That is a rusty patch bumblebee. Yes. So, the rusty patch bumblebee is now, um, it's an endangered species, unfortunately, at the national level. Uh, but, um, we have discovered uh, populations here at the zoo. We found 30 of them on zoo grounds last year, exactly in these places where there had not been habitat a few years ago. We created habitat for an endangered species, and those populations are probably in pretty good shape now. So you have the ability to make a small impact, plant it, and they can come. Now the rusty patch bumblebee, like I said, is endangered. It has experienced a massive decline, about 90% in the last couple of decades. Historically, it ranged from eastern North Dakota all the way to Maine and down into Georgia. And if in that little gray, grayed out region, you just imagine that whole area full of, of bumblebees. It was among the top five most common bumblebees across that entire range historically. It was a not an interesting bee until it disappeared. So, um, luckily, we still have some healthy populations. And in, interestingly, that's the Twin Cities. It's Madison, <laughs> it's Milwaukee, <laughs> it's, the out, it's the outskirts of Chicago. Some, to some degree, that's an artifact of just, that's where more people are living and more people are looking. But it's also not a coincidence it's not just a correlation with people because there are people looking really hard in like New Jersey and Massachusetts where there used to be so many of these bumblebees that are now gone. So there clearly are range-wide problems. We think one of the bigger things that's going on with them has been the disappearance or with, was actually diseases that have moved from hothouse tomato uh, bumblebee farming. But the, so there are bumblebees that are used commercially, brought into tomato hothouses and used for, for tomato pollination. They had diseases in them that spread to wild populations. A third of all bumblebees in the country are in decline. A third of the species. We have 23 species of, of bumblebees in Minnesota. And then many of them are going down with the rusty patches. One of those weird situations where Minnesota is actually holding on to some of the better populations in the world. So you have a unique capacity, presumably your metro resident, to be able to help this endangered species. Here's one of them, right in front of the east entrance to the zoo. Now, third thing, I want you to be able to. I want you to report your bumblebee sightings. We have very few. Um, we we need more and more sightings of these bumblebees to really understand how much of the range they actually have disappeared from. And there are some really neat citizen science opportunities out there. Basically, you take a picture of a bumblebee, upload it to Bumblebee Watch. There's now an app for that. And it gets sent to an expert as long as you've got a, some, like you can tell them where it was and when, and they will identify. You don't need to worry about identifying it, but it's added to a now a national and really an international database of bumblebee observations. And this is going to be one of the most important ways that we learn the true distribution of rusty patch bumblebee and to be able to detect the clones and other species at the same time. So, and then I also want you to encourage, encourage you to stop and learn more. I know what I know, I don't know everything either. So there are uh, luckily a lot of experts in the Twin Cities that are doing other neat things with, with pollinators that I encourage you to branch out into as well. Um, this was, uh, for example, this was one of those bumblebee surveys that was done at the zoo here last year, um, where we first found the rusty patch. A question? Um, birds, some birds can adapt to urban Yeah, so some birds can adapt to urban life, can the pollinators too? It's a good question. I think some species are going to have more ability to do that than others. And I don't know what the particular features are of that. It's a good question. And it might have to do more with kind of the stressors that are going on in, in certain places versus other areas. One more, yeah. Uh, you have the opportunity as a gardener to cut down like grasses and things in the fall. Yep. versus letting them winter and then cutting down in the spring. Does one method help with pollinators more than another? 
So the question is, when would you cut down, like you say, your tall grasses or other or flowers from the year? Do you do should, is it better to do that in winter, going into winter, or coming out out of spring? And I would say it's better coming out of spring, um, because there are stem boring pollinators. Some of the bees actually use the stems of flowering stalks from that year as their as their overwintering spots. Um, usually, those are going to be more towards the ground, so a little closer to the ground. Um, you probably within the first foot or so, but I'm not a complete expert on them, some of that, and I think we don't always know either. But yeah, so a lot of these plants are going to be able to provide that, that overwintering resource as a shelter as well. So. And then five, um, engage to inspire. And so this is really about making those personal connections with nature. We are losing contact with nature. There are not enough people getting out anymore. I'm guilty of looking at my phone too much as well. But um, this, is a, this is a real problem where people are just not getting enough green time. We are forgetting the names of common things as a society. Are you working with hunting groups? <laughs> are we working with hunting groups? Um, we have not to, to this date, uh, but the, uh, there, are, there are definite connections that could be engaged that employed here. And I found no one of the organizations that is also providing seed packets. They work closely with Pheasants Forever, for example. Um, so I end up also not being able to get out of the field as much as I want to. I mostly am an administrator at this point. I have a PhD in biology, but I'm largely stuck behind the grass trying to, or behind, behind the desk trying to execute this program. I do work at a zoo, but I do not always have a parrot on my shoulder. <laughs> that was a rarity. Um, I also end up having to try to get out and, and try to make a change in terms of, of and provide an expertise at the state level. As Carol mentioned earlier, I'm a member of the interagency pollinator team and that really is trying to coordinate pollinator protection efforts across the state and, and what agencies are doing. Sometimes that means I get called up for the state legislature. But a lot of the times we are scientists too and so we we, we know what we know, we do we always know how to communicate it really well to other people. Um, and we work with this butterfly that most people have never heard of. And it's got a name, Orisma Pawashik, and most people don't even know how to say Pawashik. Well, it's a tribal name, it's derived from Chief Pawashik. He was the chief of the, the Black Hawk tribe in Iowa, um, and ended up having to sign the treaty that ended the U.S. Black Hawk War and ceded the state of Iowa to the U.S. government. So this butterfly has got a really powerful legacy behind it that most people also don't know. It's, and it was first found in Kawashi County, Iowa. But as a scientist, and we usually are, are talking in codes amongst each other, so we'll combine like the beginning of Arisma and the beginning of Kawashi and call it a WAPO. Like nobody's going to know what that is. Or we take Kawashi and Skipperling and PO and SK and call it POSC. Nobody's going to know what that is. Other people have, have taken Powashik and called it Posh. Um, and the, really the question now is how do we dress up, how do we spice up this butterfly and make it a little more sporty? Or how do we um, take this, this butterfly that nobody really knows about and, and make it something a little more interesting? <laughs> how do we spice it up and dress it up? Right? But, Thank you. I have to credit one of our colleagues that was working on a conservation workshop for Power Sheet Sea Rolling last year, last week, Katie O'Donnell in California and Florida, um, who I think we, these just are, need to be more like the Spice Girls. We need to make them more interesting. So, got to make it more posh. That means sometimes we got we to gotta get out there and make ourselves a little more posh too. We got to dress up as the Coast Skippers and, and attack people with knowledge on Halloween. <laughs> After all, you know, it's the vertebrates that really get the attention out there, right? Those are the endangered species most people know about, them. but the vertebrates are a tiny little slice of life. They are not the, they are not the most abundant thing of life on Earth. Those are, that's really the insects. So we need to think about those sad little insects as we, as we are moving forward and, and talking about uh, conservation in the same way. We gotta get out there and we gotta get our hands dirty. We gotta engage and collect the data we need, but also then do it in a family and, and public friendly way. So will you help engage? Thank you.
the new zoo was there. Um, but I'm wondering, are you working with any of the local high schools? Because if you can capture some of those kids and engage them, they yeah. might end up, you know, being the ones that come along with the answers that you're looking for. Yeah, the question is, uh, are we engaging much in schools with, with this? And I think that's an area that needs to be done more. I do get asked to give talks before school sometimes, but um, there, there needs to be more of that, unfortunately. Um, and me as an administrator, I'm stuck behind my desk and I don't have the ability to get out as much as I need to. I think that's, a, that's an important need. Yeah, good question. In the back. Um, oh, yeah. You do that. <laughs> me? Okay. Him first. Globally, uh, are other countries doing pollinator? Are there countries globally doing pollinator protection programs, for example, or, or aware of it? Um, I think it's probably a mixed bag. Um, I think the U.S. is doing some really important things. Um, it, it's been a little patchy at the national level with different state provisions and, and interests like that. Um, I think most countries are not fully engaged in it. There was actually a UN report, though, that just came out um, a couple weeks ago, though, that highlighted pollinators. It was, it was really a cold, systemic report of, of the status of nature globally, and it was really raising some alarms about mass extinction events and losing millions of species in the next few decades. Um, and, but there was a whole, I think, a whole chapter in there just on pollinators, and I ought to be reading up on that as well. Um, but I think there's a, there is a rising awareness globally. Um, it's a question, I think, of ability to execute, and, and there's a whole lot of data we just don't know, unfortunately. So it's a matter of just getting people on the ground, too, in a lot of cases. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just had a couple of, kind of um, maybe you've covered it in the first 10 minutes, but then a little bit late. Sure. Um, is there a, I did not cover that question. What is the difference between a butterfly and a moth? Well, the, the real trick answer is actually all butterflies are moths. Yeah, tricky. Um, butterflies are about, there are about 15,000 species of butterflies in the world and about 200,000 species of moths. Um, and butterflies are perfectly nested within the bigger pie of moths. They are a piece of the moth diversity, really. Um, in terms of differences, um, Butterflies tend to be more day-flying, moths mostly are night-flying, but there are lots of day-flying moths, for example, as well. Um, kind of the, your usually easiest answer is the shape of the antenna, where in butterflies they've got a club at the tip of the antenna, in moths it either is just a little hair or it's feathered. Um, there's some other differences, but that's kind of your, your easy go-to. Yeah, moths are especially good, important, and pollinators, and especially for night flowering plants, too. Yeah. In the back. So there is an encouragement. I belong to Matamita Garden Club, and we are really pushing pollinators, but there are a lot more nurseries in Minnesota and Wisconsin that are selling, native, the only thing they sell are native plants. Yeah. A lot of them are online, you get them online. But that's very encouraging, I think. I agree, yeah, the question is about native plant nurseries, and we were actually quite lucky in the Twin Cities and, and Minnesota in general to have a large number of native plant growers. Um, I think that's not true for most states. So I could make that by native, by native, by native, by native plea in a different state, and it would be a lot harder to pull off. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we use a lot of those native nurseries as well for our own rearing and procedures as well. So um, there's Dozens. I can't recommend any particular one because I'm an agency and I am an agent of the state of Minnesota as an employee of the Minnesota Zoo, so I can't pick a chooser or winner or loser at that point. Um, but I will say that there's a lot out there and some good choices too. And, and an important factor in that is, is to, to ask, even if they, they don't are exclusively a native plant grower, um, to ask them if they're if they are, for example, um, using systemic insecticides in there and they're growing. Um, so that, those are really important factors and not all nurseries are going to know that question. And so kind of the power of the purse is going to be important there. The city of Burnsville is having a native plant sale this weekend. Oh, great. City of Burnsville, native plant 
stay on this weekend. Hopefully it doesn't get rained out. <laughs> Outside, you can better. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Depending on native plants, I've heard that there are cultivars of native plants that are designed to be more showy. Right. I've heard that those are less pollinator friendly. Yes. Is there any truth to that? The question is about how the, so there are cultivars of native plants and, and are they still as pollinator friendly? Uh, it depends on how far down the cultivar chain it's been manipulated. So for example, the purple cone flowers, there are white versions of it out there. Those are much less attractive to pollinators. Um, so um, the color differences, that can make a big difference. But then also, um, so probably one generation out or one sort of tweak on a system is probably still going to be providing similar rewards um, versus the, the, the truly wild native ones. But you're right there, it, it probably doesn't take much for a cultivar to become a little less useful uh, for, for, from a pollinator perspective. Yeah. I have two easy questions. I like One easy questions. One is about the um, Tuzet moth. Mm -hmm. And I belong to Minnesota Monarch Madness. And we've always been told to remove them because they eat up the milkweeds <laughs> so fast so that there's no place to lay eggs or whatnot. So, I mean, I personally have been relocating them, but, yeah. you know, what do you think about that? Because otherwise we don't have a food source for the aggressive eating caterpillars. And right. then I'll ask you my second Sure. Question. Yeah, the question's about the, the tussock moths in there. All those little baby shitsu caterpillars eating all the milk we down. And it's true. Um, there are a lot of caterpillars. They are, they are communal caterpillar. Um, they, they use kind of group defense. Um, and it takes one female laying eight, eight to ten eggs on a plant for those caterpillars to eat, 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 eat the complete, com entire plant. And the, the, the monarch um, caterpillar right before it's ready to form a chrysalis, you know, eats two, three, four large leaves a day. Yeah. So it's minimizing their food source. But my um, next question is, I actually work with the Prince Rogers Nelson alumni. And a lot of people don't know that Prince put $2.5 million into the Urban Bee Project. Mm -hmm. And we have had a problem with um, the bees evacuating or leaving the colonies. And so that was interesting. Someone asked about urban adapting. And um, just kind of wondering, because it actually did happen in our lot too, which is not urban. But I know this is a phenomenon, but we don't really have answers about this disappearance from the colonies. Yeah, so what, the question is what might be going on with honeybees and declines, for example? Well, and they and, just like literally evacuate away. Yeah, why, why might they leave? Um, I, I, it's a good, it's a, probably a complicated answer. The, the, the general idea of the colony collapse of, of honeybees um, is tied to one of these networks of, of many things going on. Some of that's pesticides, some of that's parasites that are inside the colony. Um, some of that is lack of nutrition. And that's, that's a big limiting factor in a lot of places. There are, are just a lot of, of, there are a lot of places without adequate food sources for, for our pollinators. And if those are limiting, they're, they, they're gonna have to relocate. And that was the reason that so much money was invested because of um, community gardens yeah. that people right. now started in hopes that you know the pollinators would help with the exactly. community gardens. And yeah, so the so that that's exactly right. So using community gardens as one of those places where you could be supporting pollinators and helping you grow your tomatoes better. Um, each of those little small actions are going to have a big impact. So collectively, will you help? That's one of those features that we can be really adding into um, and making that impact. And um, it might not seem like you are by uh, doing enough, but it's kind of remarkable you put out a, a native wildflower and it doesn't take long before they start finding it. So the little impacts can be big. Okay, one more question. Yeah, there. Besides the bumblebee watch app, is there one for butterflies and yeah, so besides the bubble we watch, what other things could you be reporting your citizen science data to for butterflies, for example? Um, iNaturalist is fabulous, and there's um, quite a few programs within that, for example, that you could be uploading your photos to. Um, there's one 
uh, that's for the Vanessa Migration Project. So the, the, the migration of painted ladies and, and red admirals that's occurring right now as they're moving into Minnesota. There is a researcher in Iowa that's very interested in, in the, how that is all the, the mechanisms behind that. So for example, you can be reporting directly to those sorts of situations. Or you can just like, hey, I found this in my yard, I'm going to upload and see what it is. Um, that is that can be tied in with programs like eButterfly, uh, which is like eBird on the sort of bird side of the world. Um, so I would say those are your, kind of your two big ones. Um, Bubble we watch and iNaturalist. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming, everybody tonight. I can stay down here and ask more questions. Make sure you grab your uh, your swag on the way out. <laughs> Thanks.